big story. Come on, come on. Get the lid out. Did you see him? Did you see Doug? The way he was lying there? Come on, close that door. How did you like that guy to deal, huh? <laughs> he thought he was going to take in a big fight. And the way he says to the other guy, I got a pair. And one more to go with it, I got three of a kind. <laughs> and then, boom. Why did Doug have to get it? Why, Doug? All right, all right, quit the crying. So Doug's dead, so what? The guy with three of a kind is dead, too. How do you like that? I caught my jacket on a nail. I paid $75 for that jacket. Oh, Doug. Why, Doug? <laughs> Chicago, Illinois. From the front pages of the Chicago Sun-Times comes the story of a poker game that ended in death. Chicago, Illinois. The story as it actually happened. William Doherty's story as he lived it. First name is Bill. Last name, Doherty. One of the proudest names in Chicago newspaperdom. For the past 30 years, there hasn't been a single paper in Chicago that didn't have a Doherty on the police run. You and your four brothers, in a sense, had cornered the crime market in the Windy City. But even the Dohertys sleep. And that is what you are doing this mild May morning at 1 a.m., when the bane of all Doherty lives, the city editor, that's the work, the mechanism, that is the bane of all Doherty nights. Hello. Were you asleep? Oh, who is this? Andrews? No, I was just sitting here waiting for you to call. Well, Sonny, you better rub the sleep out of your eyes. Uh-huh. On account of while you were snoring, three mm-hmm. hoods had the lovely suburb of Evanston all wrapped up. Could have carried it away, for all you know. Well, since when does a five-and-dime stick-up give reason to yank me out of bed? Oh, didn't I tell you? There were a couple of murders. Who? Oh. One of the hoods, and you remember Judge Crane's bailiff? Benny? Not that sweet guy. Yeah. He and a couple of friends were playing poker. The hoods walked in. One of the hoods got it, and so did Benny. Hey, that's a story. I'll be right over. <laughs> You drive past Benny's house, en route to the Fillmore Street Police Station. There will be bereavement in the house, some hysterics, and a few facts, so you can come back later. Right now, you want to learn what happened. One of the poker players, George Curlick, has a fabulous eye for detail. It was going around 11. Up to then, we'd been playing sociable poker, 5 and 10. I was losing, so I said, uh, how about a quarter and a half? Benny was way ahead. He says, make it no limit. So then we settled down. And when you play that kind of poker, the house could fall down around you and you wouldn't notice it. Yeah, it's about the size of it. The pots were getting big and bigger. They must have opened the door without anybody hearing them. And all of a sudden, they were standing there right at the table. And then first one, this tall blonde one, he says, gentlemen, this is a stick-up. Well, we were so surprised and it happened so fast, you couldn't exactly be sure. I didn't even get a good look at the other two. There were two others? Yeah. Benny says, who are you kidding? But this tall blonde one got a gun out, and Benny reaches for his coat. It's hanging over my chair. And see, he's a bailiff. He's got the right to carry a gun. Yeah, sure. And before you know it, this blonde kid shoots him. Then I went out of my mind. I got Benny's gun out, and I just squeezed the trigger, and the tall blonde one fell down. Then one of them must have sapped me, and I I went out. Well, what about the others? There were five of you in the game. Oh, uh, Harry and Jerry and Willie Salt, who owns the liquor store. Mm-hmm. They just sat there. They were so scared they didn't open their mouths. And you didn't get a look at either of the other two? No, just uh, one was a kind of a kid about 18 or something. Before I conked out, I seen this kid. You know what he was doing? Uh. He was down on the floor, like holding the head of this one that I shot, and, and like rocking it in his arms. And he kept saying, Doug, Doug. No, Doug. 
Then the other guy grabbed him and they beat it. He was almost crying. Crying, yeah. At the morgue, Captain Michaels lets you get the details because the name of Doherty is still a pass in the Chicago police station. So it's an easy matter for you to learn the facts about Doug, the dead hood. Douglas Grimko, age 30, larceny with felonious intent, three years, parole. Parole violation, armed robbery, five years. The usual depredation on the usual form cards. The usual picture, the usual aliases, the usual story. But no more. And that noon, when the story's been written, and in the edition, Andrews sidles over to you, a long needle in his hand. Looks like the Doritors are slipping. Look, Andrews, will you talk like a human being to me for a second? You told me yourself no editor is human. All right, all right. A kid who gets down on the floor and holds a dead guy's head in his arms and cradles it, that don't sound like a hood to me. Still and all walking in there in the middle of a poker game, big as life. That's about as pro a job as I've heard in a long time. Well, you'll straighten it out. Yeah, sure, you're a great help. Hey, maybe the funeral. Maybe, maybe the funeral. Doug Grimko gets buried this afternoon. <laughs> This funeral is a traditional funeral, with a profusion of flowers that the poor always reserve for last rites. And this, too, doesn't sound like a professional hood. In walking through the group, the sad people in their sad clothing, you notice... He was never very good to her, or to Herbie. There are no wails, no screeches, no rending of clothing. And when you hear it again, it strikes you. She was wise not to come. Herbie, too, not to see it. This is a funeral with the chief mourner's absent. She is his mother, and Herbie his brother. They're not there. Why? And you find your why in the battered house on East Claiborne, where his sister lives. She wasn't at the funeral either. Why didn't you go? What business is that of yours? Why didn't your mother go and your brother Herbie? You get out of here. Look, miss, I'm a newspaper man. You're liable to get the same questions asked if you're not so polite. Well, Mama went away. What's she going to do? Go to his funeral? Stand there and have all those friends point their fingers at her? So her and Herbie went away. Is that a crime? Nope. Not unless Herbie had something to do with Doug. You get out of here. I'd rather answer the cops. <laughs> The Bureau of Identification tells you that Herbert Grimko is 17, that he weighs 142 pounds, that he's a graduate of the Chicago Parental School, which is a reform school, and that he was sent there when he was 13 on a burglary charge, and that he assaulted three policemen resisting arrest. And that, too, is a story. Dead Hood's brother, fugitive. Search out for brother of would-be gunman. Police today are on the lookout for 17-year-old Herbert Grimko. Doherty speaking. You think you're pretty smart, don't you? Who's this? All I got to tell you is you better get yourself a lawyer. I got that story you wrote right in front of me, and my brother Herbie is no fugitive from justice. You better get yourself a lawyer, mister. I don't think I'm the guy who needs a lawyer. Suppose you get a little smart. The fellow's brother gets shot. He doesn't show up at the funeral. He's got a record. He's the guy who needs the lawyer. He'll never give him a break. Just because he's Doug's brother. He's a good kid, and just because he's Doug's brother... All right, all right, look. Let me tell you something about the way police work. Now, maybe they're wrong. But they think your kid brother is a fugitive from justice. He's with your mother, isn't he? Now, maybe some cop will see him, and he'll make a wrong move, and somebody will get awful hurt. So what you say is true, tell him to come back. For his own good, tell him to come back. He hates the cops, and they hate him because of Doug. Look, you sound like a fair guy... Would you talk to him? Me? He'd talk to somebody who talks his language. He's only a kid. You call me when he's ready to talk. You figure that's the end of that. But it isn't. And within 12 hours, she walks into your office and she says, If you're ready, 
He's waiting in a car in the alley just behind the sun time. They won't give me a break. They never give a kid like me a break. I got a record. And I'm Doug's brother. And what good does it do if I tell you I didn't have anything to do with it? Nothing. I wasn't nowhere near the place. Where were you? I was kidding around the whole evening with one of my friends with a pool stick. From ten, going on till midnight. The shooting was about eleven, wasn't it? You were suddenly in the midst of a decision, Bill Doherty. A kid is pouring out his guts. Maybe the truth, maybe not. You've told his sister you'll help him. You've also told yourself that you'll write and act honestly. What do you do now? Turn him in? I ain't lived very long. We never had nothing. But every time I walk on the street after 10 o'clock, they look at me like I'm up to something. Then they try to pin things on me just because of Doug. Because of that time I got high and fought the cops. It has the ring of truth. In this dismal light, in a back alley, in an old car, someone is speaking what he considers the truth. You take a big breath and say it. Well... Maybe you've had bad breaks. Maybe the cards have been stacked against you. But if you want half a fair shake, or a quarter even, walk into the Fillmore station. Talk to Captain Joey Michaels. Tell him Doherty sent you. I know what they'll do. I know. What else are you going to do, kid? What else? I'll back you up. Cy Harris, returning it to your narrator, and the big story of William Doherty, as he lived it and wrote it. It's a few hours, Bill Doherty, since you told Herbie Grimko, the brother of the dead hood, to give himself up to the police, that this was the best way, that you would stand behind him. And now, in your city room, your editor, Bob Andrews, sidles over, no needle in his hand this time... But maybe something worse. I just had a call from Captain Michaels over at Fillmore Station. That so? Your kid, Herbie, showed up. I thought he would. Three of the guys at the poker game identified him straight out as the second of the three hoods. Oh, how do they know? They admitted they were so mixed up they didn't know what was going on. As a matter of fact, Kurlick, who killed the first hood, when he saw Herbie at the police station, nearly strangled him. You know, Benny was a cousin of his. Oh, well, it's very easy for guys to go wild and make identifications. Very easy. What did the kids say? It doesn't deny he was there. He doesn't admit he was there. He's just not talking. Well, he's scared. That's all. He's scared. So Michael says he wants you to come over there because the kid trusts you. All he wants me to do is go over and get the kid to spill his guts, huh? Look, this is a kid I told to do something. This is a kid I told I'd stand back of. What am I going to do now? Sell him out? That's entirely up to you, Bill. Entirely. And Michael said for me to tell you it's entirely up to you. <laughs> How do you ride the horns of a dilemma? Answer, you don't. You face what you knew all along you were going to have to face. Your two loyalties to the truth and to the kid who never had a break and who probably isn't getting one right now. So you're alone with him in the Fillmore station. I tell you, I told you the whole thing. I'll tell you anything you want to know. Don't tell me. Tell them. I don't want to tell them. I don't want to tell them nothing. I ain't going to talk to those guys. Look, Michaels is as nice a guy as they come. He's no slugger. There's ways they're hitting a the guy without hitting him. Why don't you listen to me? Because I'd have to tell them. Would you? Would you also tell them if I wasn't there? Herbie, what is the truth? Like I told you, I was in this pool place. The trading post, it's called. With my friend Lester Gates. Yeah, yeah, you told me all about that. Fooling around with a pool cue from 11 until 12 with Lester Gates. So, all right. As soon as I heard about the killing and how Doug got shot, and how everybody knows about me and Doug being so close, Ma and me went up to Muskegon and spent the night there. The next morning, we took a bus and started to California. 
You see, Ma's sick. She had to go to the funeral and face a friend and see him dead there. I didn't know what it would have done to her. Herbie, three men identified you at that card party. Three men said you were there. That when Doug got shot, you got down on the floor and put his head in your lap. They say you kept saying, Doug, oh, Doug. It's not true. I was in the trading post. But doesn't it sound like you, Herbie? The kid who would pick up his own brother's head and say what you said? It was somebody else. Is that the best you can do? See? See, now you'll tell him. And he'll take that and he'll string me up with it. You're no better than a cop. I didn't say I'd tell anybody anything. And I won't. Now, just tell me one thing. Is what you said the truth? I swear. I swear on... on my sick mother's life. All right. We'll see. It's an oath not taken lightly. He means it. And although there are holes in the story, you go out with the fullest kind of objectivity, either to patch up those holes or to drive a truck through. The man at the trading post, he remembers. Yeah, that's right. He ran up six racks. Him and, uh, what's his name? Lester Gates. Yeah, him and Gates. Six racks. Let's see. It was uh, going on 12 they walked in. One hole widens. Going on 12. The murder was 11.15 p.m. exactly. You drive your car slowly from the house on Adams Street to the trading post. Time elapsed. 14 minutes. If he was in on the killing, then he had adequate time to get to the trading post at 12. The hole is bigger. Well, I was going by. I mean, this friend of mine, he says to meet him outside the trading post. And I seen him and Lester walk in. They were swacking. What time was that, miss? Well, I know, because I was looking at my watch, and this fellow was supposed to meet me at 11.30. It was five minutes to 12. That's how late he was. The hull is widened and reinforced. And now a man, age 30, stocky, smiling, walks up to you. I've been looking all over town for you, even down to the paper. They said you was up here. Who are you? Lester Gates is my name. What were you looking all over town for me about, Gates? Well, on account of I want to tell you about Herbie. On account of I heard you was checking up on Herbie. You know, about me and him in the trading post. Mm -hmm. Well, we was there. We, uh, We were playing pool. Six or eight racks we played. Well, that's fine. I'm glad you told me. I, uh, I didn't tell you the time. I met him there. What time was it? Uh, about one o'clock we started. The hole is wider and jagged now. Somebody is doing a lot of lying. Not the owner of the pool parlor or the girl. Why should they? But either Lester Gates or Herbie Grimko. And you're back at the Fillmore Station. Two people said you were at the trading post at 12, starting at 12. They're lying. Everybody in the world's a liar, Herbie. You're fencing me in with all this talking. You're digging a hole for me. Herbie, listen to me now. Don't say a word, just listen. I made a pledge to you. I said I'd stand behind you. But you can't stand behind a liar because he gets it and you get it too. Well, you ain't a liar. I swear to you. It takes 14 minutes only to get from the Adams Street house to the pool room. You could have done it. I didn't. You took your mother up to Muskegon and you took a bus and went straight out west, huh? That's right. Till I called up my sister to see how things were. And she said to come back. Well, there are no buses that leave Muskegon and go straight out west. They come to Chicago first. You got to change for another bus at Chicago. No kid on the run would do that. You couldn't. You didn't. It, it was a, a special bus they were running. There are no buses from Muskegon out west. None. You told me your mother is sick. Would you take your sick mother on a five-day bus ride? All right. What do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? Who was it took Doug's head in his lap and said, Doug, oh, Doug, who was it? You know who it was. All right, now, who was with you? I was alone. Who was the third guy? I was alone. Oh, you crazy kids, you with the cold you've got for yourself. Look, it's perfectly obvious what happened. You and Gates agreed that if there was any trouble, you would swear you were with each other from 10 o'clock on. You know what Gates said? He said he met you at the trading post at 1 o'clock. Don't you see what he's doing? I was with him from 10 o'clock on. He's going to make you and Doug the four guys, and he walks on a bit clean. Herb, listen to me. 
Those three men who identified you, they saw Gates and it didn't register. They didn't identify him. Think about how he left Doug there. Think about that. Doug was dead. And Gates kept yelling how he tore his new $75 board jacket. Now you're being smart. And as you expect, of course, he's disappeared. Gates. He put his knife in and disappeared. But this kind always leaves a trail. Living this kind of life, they ruin others on the way to the latest ruination. And you find one such person, a 26 girl, a dice girl who opens her mouth with extraordinary pleasure. In my time, I've been taken, but never by such a louse. Where is he now? He was walking around till yesterday saying how he put the squeegee on the Grimco brothers. How Doug got killed and Herbie was taking the rap, and he was waltzing and scot free. You know what that loss does? Sells heist lists. Heist lists? Sure. Cases businessmen. You know, what time they close their places and how much cash they got when they play poker sessions, the stakes, things like that. Then he sells them lists. Well, Lester sold a list of the Grimco brothers for a cut. Then he cuts himself into the deal and gets paid from both ends. Well, that's a nice kind of louse. Where is he? Mister, with the greatest of pleasure. With the greatest of pleasure. 1316 Southern Avenue. Take him good. The taking, with the help of Captain Michaels, is an easy matter. The breakdown is easy, too. Because his car was seen, the witnesses who placed Herbie placed Gates, too, at the trading post at 12. And the list, the heist list, undoubtedly kept for later resale was found in the thick wallet. But the ease came really in the words of Herbie Grimko. I do hereby acknowledge that this confession is made of my own free will. Without coercion. Without promises of any kind of immunity. My brother Doug and me and Lester Gates and the holdup of a house on Adams Street. And things went wrong. Just as one of the fellas in the card game was saying that he had three of a kind. Three of a kind. The brother who was the hood and shot and got shot. The bland, filthy heist salesman who betrayed his own accomplices. And the kid who never had a chance and never would again. They were different, but also the same. Three of a kind. We read you that telegram from William Doherty of the Chicago Sun-Times. Brother of dead gangster in tonight's big story was found guilty and sentenced to 20 years. The heist salesman Gates also got 20 years and another term of 25 to 40 years for armed robbery. Both are still in the Joliet Penitentiary. And so ends another big story. In order to protect the names of people actually involved in tonight's authentic big story, the names of all characters in the dramatization were changed, with the exception of the newspaper reporters. <laughs>